Insightful podcasts by informative hosts. Insights into things. A podcast network. Welcome to Insights into Tomorrow, where we take a deeper look into how the issues of today will impact the world of tomorrow, from politics and world news to media and technology. We discuss how today's headlines are becoming tomorrow's reality. Welcome to Insights into Tomorrow. This is episode 13, Modern Monopolies. I'm your host, Joseph Whalen, and my co-host, Sam Whalen. How you doing today, Sam? Doing okay. How you doing? Doing all right. So today's topic is one that we've kind of been tossing around for a little while now, and uh, it's in the news a lot lately with a lot of the tech companies and politics involved. Uh, it, it became kind of came to the forefront uh few months back during the Trump administration, uh, they were kind of going up against some of the big tech companies, Facebook, Amazon, Google, and so forth. Uh, so I thought it was worthwhile to sort of take a look at this. So today we're going to discuss what monopolies are in the modern age. We'll understand what a monopoly is, how they operate, and why they're determined, uh, why they're detrimental to a free and open market. Yet they're unique, uh, a unique product of capitalism. We'll take a brief look at the history of monopolies in America and how they've been handled before. And we'll look at the future of what today's monopolies and the complications inherent in regulating them are. Uh, ready to get started? Yep. All right. <laughs> So what is a monopoly? So in doing research for today's episode, I went to a couple of different sites. And, and this definition, I think, captured it best. It came from Investopedia.com. They say a monopoly refers to when a company and its product offerings dominate a sector or industry. Monopolies can be considered an extreme result of free market capitalism in that absent any restrictions or restraints, a single company or group becomes large enough to own all or nearly all the market, goods, supplies, commodities, infrastructure, so forth, for a particular type of product or service. The term monopoly is often used to describe an entity that has total or near control of a market. Natural monopolies can exist where there are high barriers to entry, a company has a parent on their a patent on their products or is allowed by governments to provide essential services. So based on that definition, let me ask you real quick. Do you think we have modern monopolies that fit this bill? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I don't think it takes that long to figure it out. There's like three drug stores. That's the first one that came to mind for me. Like if you think about it, Rite Aid, uh, Rite Aid Walgreens and CVS. Um, that's just an example airlines too like if you just i don't know i feel like if you just think about it there's there's pretty clear examples of at least a handful sure yeah so in understanding a monopoly a monopoly is characterized by the absence of competition which can lead to high costs for consumers inferior products and services and corrupt behavior a company that dominates a business sector or industry can use that dominance to its advantage and at the expense of others. So taking your example of the drugstores, if, if there are three drugstores that control all the, the pharmaceuticals to consumers, is that really a monopoly if there's three of them? Uh, I think it's a monopoly if by there being three and they're being so established that it eliminates the ability for other new drugstores to rise up. I think that's where you get into the monopoly territory if they're creating that barrier of entry. So it's it's in that case it's a monopoly of three where they're colluding to prevent competition at that point in time essentially. Yeah, potentially, yeah. They also say that it can create artificial scarcities, fix prices and circumvent natural laws of supply and demand, which I think is exactly where your pharmacy scenario falls into place. 
It can impede new entrants into the field, discriminate and inhibit experimentation on uh, or new product development, while the public, robbed of the recourse of using a competitor, is at its mercy. Do you think, again, sticking with our pharmacy example, do you think that uh, the consumers are at a detriment because of having three major pharmacies control the entire industry? Uh, I'm not so sure about that because, I mean, the medication is still – as long as the medication is effective from pharmacy to pharmacy, that's the important thing. I mean, it's not like you're getting, like, faulty products. Now, if say, for example, Walgreens had their over-the-counter allergy medication and it was defective – but there's only Walgreens in your area. That's where you run into some issues. But I think as long as the products are still working, then, I mean, monopolies are still generally bad. But I think in that example, you could probably get away with it. Well, how about an example where you've got three pharmacies and they all decide that instead of selling a, a, your allergy medicine to you at 20% over cost, you know, with a 20% margin – they're going to up it to 50%. They're all going to sell for 50%. So there's no one in the market that they can that the consumer can go to mm -hmm. to get it at that reduced price. Do you think that would be monopolistic? Yeah, definitely. Because at that point, they're using their their hold on the industry to screw over the customer, which is where you get into like the definition of monopolies. Exactly. Yeah. So they go on to say that a monopolized market often becomes an unfair, unequal, and inefficient market mergers and acquisitions among companies in the same business are highly regulated and researched for this reason firms are typically forced to divest assets if federal authorities believe proposed mergers or a takeover will violate anti-monopoly laws we just had a, a major takeover very recently among the cellular carriers oh yeah where t-mobile bought out sprint so we had four major competitors in the market T-Mobile brought out Sprint to become the number two in consumer size at that point in time and to reduce the market down from four to three. At the same time, one of the contingencies associated with that was the emergence of another network that would come out eventually, which it hasn't come out yet. I think it's Dish is going to be running this particular network, but they're going to be using the services of the existing network. So it's almost like it was a fictional way of putting a fourth competitor into the market. Mm -hmm. Like a puppet competitor almost. Exactly. So in that instance, do you think the T-Mobile merger with Sprint will be good or bad for consumers? I think <clears> – I don't know. I think about this with, with mobile companies especially. Like there's whole regions of the country where you can only get one mobile service provider. And I think by merging like that, it's going to make that problem even worse. So say you, you're. I know in this area that's it's, it's kind of like that with T-Mobile. If you're forced to have T-Mobile and now Sprint, but the coverage is poor and you don't have any other option, I think that's that's definitely an issue. Yeah, it's because you're getting an, you're forced to have an inferior product just due to the monopoly. Right, and there's no incentive for them to improve their product because right. there's no competition. Right, and what are you going to do? Move? <laughs> like, exactly. You're not going to move because you're a cellular yeah. carrier. Exactly. So they see monopolies typically have an unfair advantage over their competition since they're either the only provider of a product or control most of the market share or customers for their product. Although monopolies might differ from industry to industry, they tend to share similar characteristics. Why don't you tell us what these characteristics are? Sure. So the first one is the high barrier of entry, which we kind of talked about already. Uh, this is when competitors are not able to enter the market and the monopoly can easily prevent competition from developing their foothold in an industry uh, by acquiring that competition. Uh, sort of like we, we talked about with the mobile company where they put, I guess not really, because they kind of let them use their own services. Uh, the second ex example is the single seller. There's only one seller in the market, meaning the company becomes the same as the industry it serves. Uh, the third is price maker. The company that operates the monopoly decides the price of the product that it will sell without any competition, keeping their prices in check. Uh, as a result of this, monopolies can raise prices whenever they want. And finally, the economy of scale. Uh, a monopoly often can produce at a lower cost than smaller companies. Monopolies can buy huge quantities of inventory, uh, for example, usually at a volume discount. As a result of this, a uh, monopoly can lower its prices so much that smaller competitors can survive. Think like Walmart. Um, 
Essentially, monopolies can engage in price wars due to their scale of their manufacturing and distribution networks, such as warehousing and shipping. Uh, that can be done at lower cost than any of the competitors in the industry. I guess that'd be Amazon too, both right, those companies. Yeah. So it's interesting because some of these same practices they talk about here that are considered to be monopolistic are also ones that are generally used in business for efficiency reasons. Uh, for instance, here in New Jersey, we have a lot of cranberry producers in the in the state. And one of the things that you have is you have – everyone's heard of Ocean Spray, right? Mm -hmm. You buy Ocean Spray cranberry juice off the shelves and, and whatnot. Ocean Spray is actually a cooperative. And what they do is they partner with a number of independent farmers to pool their resources – and it's not just cranberries, obviously, it's it's many other things. But they pull their resources together and sell as one single entity so they can get uh, advantages in the economy to scale by supplying all their um, entities at the same time for a, gro a bulk cost. <coughs> They're sort of fixing their prices by not competing against each other. They all agree upon a certain price that they sell at. But somehow the cooperatives aren't targeted for monopolies, even though they take on some of the same characteristics of a monopoly. Um, this has happened traditionally in the past with a lot of food industries have done this. A lot of your fast food places, when they go through franchising, they do sort of the same thing. You buy a franchise of... Uh, a pizza place, uh, you know, Papa John's or, or um, I can't think of another. Dunkin' one. Donuts. That would not be pizza, but sure, we'll oh. use that as a franchise. Yeah. Uh, but <laughs> That's the first thing when I think when I think franchise. <laughs> but yeah, that's another good example of you have a whole bunch of people that buy the stores, buy the franchise where they have the rights, but they also get all their supplies that way. So instead of you know, mom and pop down the street going out and buying flour to make donuts, they put their purchase into the corporation and the corporation buys it for 500 bakers at one time. We can get a discount on it. So that's another thing where cooper uh, cooperatives can be targeted as monopolies, but they're not in today's society. So the next thing that, that we talk about <clears throat> is what's called a natural monopoly. So a natural monopoly can develop when a company becomes a monopoly due to high fixed or startup costs in an industry. This happens a lot with utilities, internet, electricity, telephone, because of the amount of money that you have to tie up in order to provide that service, the government is willing to allow you to become a monopoly. Um, AT&T at one point in time had so much money tied up in copper it was like one third of the company's value was in copper oh, wow. just in the wires that yeah. they had because copper is a commodity. Wow. Also, natural monopolies can arise in industries that require unique raw materials, technology, or it's a specialized industry where only one company can meet the needs. Again, this goes back to AT&T. You know, they were – Bell, I guess, at the time was – that's and they wound up getting broken up in the early 80s. Um, companies that have patents on their products, which prevent competition from developing the same product in a specific field, can have a natural monopoly. So a lot of these things here have traditionally been associated with the utility sector. Your television, your cable, your internet, your um, electrical, your plumbing, um, things that aren't state-owned but offer private services. We just ran into an incident uh, last week with the uh, Colonial Pipeline where mm -hmm. they supply a chunk of refined fuels to a large sector of the country. They're a private company, but they have a monopoly on that because of how expensive it is to build a pipeline. So, let me ask you, when it comes to natural monopolies where you have this investment or you own the technology, do you think that justifies monopolistic tendencies? I think uh, I think that's a tough question to answer because it reminds me of uh, when we did our streaming services episode 
<clears throat> we talked about like something like Comcast, who's uh, internet and TV and um, there's another, oh, cell phones. And they're sort of expanding in that way too. But if, again, kind of like when we talked about with the mobile providers, if you can only have Comcast, but it's because Comcast controls all those resources, is that a bad thing? <laughs> um, I think it becomes a bad thing when you go back to the inferior product thing. If your product's bad, but you you have this obligation to provide the service because you have all the resources, then I think you also have an obligation to make the product at least usable <laughs> consistently. Well, and and to add to that is if the government is going to allow you to be a natural monopoly because of that technology or that investment, then they, there's a certain right that the government has <laughs> To, uh, we didn't check the shop beforehand, everybody. <laughs> no, we, we didn't. Just lean a lot that way. <laughs> there, uh, there's a certain obligation the government has to regulate you mm-hmm. at that point in time as an industry. Um, do you think that expectation of government regulation, because a lot of the cable companies are trying to get away from government regulation, do you think that expectation that government should have the right to do that when they grant you a monopoly is realistic? I think maybe not realistic, not in these days, because these companies have so much power. I think it's idealistic that, you know, ultimately at the end of the day, the government is going to have their the say in, in what needs to be regulated and what doesn't. But I think we're seeing so often that the companies have so much power that there's the government just chooses not to do anything. Yeah, I think you're... Which you're, we'll get into more later. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right on that one. So there's public monopolies that are set up by the government to provide essential services, such as the U S postal service. Although the U S postal service is getting a run for its money these days with private parcel companies like UPS and FedEx utilities, which we talked about already, the utilities industry is where a natural government allowed monopolies flourish until the government doesn't Allow, allow it anymore and, and it's kind of strange because <clears throat> this happened a few years back where back in the early 2000s we had a major power outage in the northeast and it turned out that power outage came was a result of a mismanaged power network out in i think ohio at the time and it's a privately owned company <clears throat> they weren't under any kind of monopolistic regulations or anything but because of the problem that they caused that took down the rest of the network in the Northeast, the government came in and imposed sanctions on them and fines and so forth. Do you think that's a way or an efficient way for the government to sort of allow monopolies to happen, but penalize them if they don't adhere to some level of standard? I mean, yeah. And I mean, that's a pretty extreme example. If you cause you know, the Northeast to have a blackout. <laughs> I think you deserve to get punished for some reason, but I think you said it was a privately owned company. It wasn't like, yeah. So if it was, I, I don't know. I think if it was a larger company, they, they might not be as harsh, you know, if it's this, if it's the small independent company, they can easily point the finger and blame them. But if it was something like general electric or something, they might be a little bit hesitant to punish them as harshly. I think. Right. No, I, I could see that. So the monopolies in these instances are allowed because the suppliers incur large costs of producing power or water or providing these services to each household. And it's considered more efficient for there to be a sole provider for these services. Do you think it's more efficient for you to have a sole cable provider? Or do you think competition in the cable market would be better for the consumers? Because right now, cable is not considered a, a um, public utility. And there's a lot of push to have it considered that way as far as protections and regulation go. If they did, do you think having two or three cable providers would be better or having a monopoly would be better? Yeah, definitely. Because I think competition, it breeds innovation, right? Because you need to be able to beat your competitor and you beat your competitor by making more money, which means having a better product in theory. So I think if if there was only one company, then they would, would just stagnate. They would settle for you know, whatever service they're going to provide. But if you've got that competition, I think that ends up benefiting the consumer in the long run. Yeah. And I think you're right. I think the only time you get innovation is when companies have to innovate. And the only time companies have to innovate is if the competition makes them, which is their number one motivation, because that's where their profits are. Or if the government forces them to, 
And to a certain extent, the government did force a lot of these cable companies to innovate their technology because they were taking bandwidth back from them, which is why we have digital TV now. You know, that was not because the cable companies were in competition for each other to provide better services. That was because the government mandated that. So you can, in certain circumstances, still have monopolies that innovate when the government forces them to do so and still allow monopolies to exist uh, in the country. So we're going to take a quick break and we're going to come back and talk about some of the antitrust laws and a little bit of what, uh, what the company, what the country has done to break up monopolies historically. Insights into teens a podcast series exploring the issues and challenges of today's youth. Talking to real teens about real teen problems. Explore issues from braces to puberty, social anxiety to financial responsibility. Each week, we talk about the topics concerning today's youth. We look at how the issues affect teens, how to cope with these issues, and how parents, friends, and loved ones can help teens handle these challenges. Check out our video episodes on youtube.com backslash insights into things. Catch our audio versions on podcast.insightsintoteens.com or on the web at insightsintothings.com. Welcome back to Insights into Tomorrow. We're talking uh, modern day monopolies today. We're going to talk a little bit about antitrust laws. And you can't really talk about monopolies unless you're talking about, unless you mention at least the Sherman Antitrust Act. So in 1890, the Sherman Antitrust Act became the first legislation passed by the U.S. Congress to limit monopolies. Uh, it had strong support by Congress. It passed the Senate with a vote of 51 to 1 and passed the House unanimously 242 to 0. Uh, and that was put in place to regulate mostly the big industries at the time, which were oil, oil, uh, locomotives, you know, your, your, your rail service, your steel industry, and so forth. Then in 1914, Two additional antitrust pieces of legisla legislation were passed uh, to pr uh, protect consumers. The Clayton Antitrust Act, which created new rules for mergers and corporate directors, and also listed specific examples of practices that would violate the Sherman Antitrust. And then the Federal Trade Commission, um, the Federal Trade Commission Act, which sets standards for business practices and enforces the two antitrust acts along with the antitrust division of the U S department of justice. So the laws are intended to preserve competition and allow smaller companies to enter a market and not to merely suppress strong companies. And I think that's a theme that I think resonates today because a lot of what people are talking about today with our big monopolies is that they're not harming people because they're not producing a product or a service. And the biggest example of this would be social media and Facebook. So Facebook isn't harming anyone by not bringing new products to market. They're just a really big company. You know, the same thing with Google. And the push today seems to be targeting, well, these companies are too big and they shouldn't be that big. And, and I think the, the point that I'm trying to make here is that's not something that the antitrust laws are designed to cope with. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, definitely. I think it's, <clears throat> these are obviously laws that were made in, you know, before 1900. So they definitely need to be updated, but I think it's, it's kind of what comes with technology, right? It's, it's you've got to make new laws. You've got to adapt the way you think about it. Cause while they're not making a product, these companies have data on everybody and when you have things like information leaks and the companies aren't necessarily held accountable like facebook has them all the time where people's personal data gets leaked and i think that that is a huge problem that should be you know more harshly punished and i think that that would 
come with a more modern look at, you know, antitrust laws. Well, and I think there was, I agree with you to a certain extent that the companies themselves have a certain obligation to protect the user's data. However, the users give the data up freely. So there's, there's not, I don't think there's really an expectation of privacy because it's a social network, right? Yeah. So when I post my information, my pictures and whatever, I'm posting them there for people to see. So I can't really get upset when, when Facebook leaks that to other people. The other problem that you run into is that the modern laws that we have have penalties that are insignificant to the size of these companies now, which I think is where some of the argument comes in that these companies are too big. You know, you might get a couple hundred thousand dollar fine for a data breach. That's like nothing. When you're a multi-billion yeah. dollar company, that's, a, you know, essentially you lost that money in the cushions of the couch. Yeah, the time it took to to draft the, the, the document to charge you, you've already made a billion dollars. Right. So there's really very little incentive to do anything other than continue business as is and just pay the fines because mm-hmm. you're still monumentally profitable. Uh, so I think there needs to be a fundamental shift in what the penalties look like in order for the penalties to have any meaning whatsoever. So in talking about breaking up monopolies, the Sherman Antitrust Act was targeted at companies like Standard Oil and even the American Tobacco Company, which didn't break up the companies. It broke up Standard Oil, but what it did was it it pushed more public awareness. Um, in 1994, the U.S. government accused Microsoft of using a significant market share in the PC operating system business to prevent competition and maintain a monopoly. Now, this is significant because I think it's the really the first modern monopoly with high-tech industry that we uh, kind of see come across the, the government's uh, crosshairs. Yeah, they, they broke up the, 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 uh, the bell companies, the phone companies and stuff like that, but I think that was less significant from a technological standpoint because it was really legacy technology. But here you have Microsoft, who is at the forefront of computer technology, but they're also internationally acclaimed for for this technology. And you have the United States that's trying to set precedent here. And I think, if anything, that's where we kind of look back to see what's going to guide our principles moving forward. What do you think about that? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think I've said it on this show before. Again, not a lawyer, but, you know, the law is about precedent, right? So something like this, this case here, sets the precedent for technology companies going forward of how their versions of monopolies, excuse me, are viewed in courts. And I think that, you know, having Microsoft be this big example in 1994 is extremely important uh, just to have something to look back at, especially, you know, I don't think anybody could have imagined what technology would have is like now compared to what it was in 1994, but it's much larger and much more in the forefront of just our daily conversations. Yeah. And essentially what happened is in 98, you had a federal district judge rule that Microsoft needed to be broken into technology companies. But that was a decision that was later reversed. There were compromises that happened. There were fines that happened. Um, Microsoft ultimately agreed to have a, um, an, a government overseer become part of the company to make sure that the company wasn't uh, engaging in monopolistic activities. Microsoft in the 80s and 90s was brutal. You know, they would, they had a philosophy of, well, let's not compete with others. Let's just destroy the competition. And they did. They were very effective at it. Yeah, I think there's an episode. I don't know if you've ever watched the CNN series. It's just called the 70s or the yeah, 80s. It's one yeah. of those. There's a whole episode on like the Apple Microsoft war. It's really interesting. Yeah. And it's funny because Microsoft destroyed Apple to the point that Apple was roughly three months away from going bankrupt. And Bill Gates, in a very famous uh, appearance mm-hmm. shows up at the at the Apple Worldwide Developer Conference via video, and Steve Jobs was still alive at the time and announced that Microsoft is investing in Apple, and they booed <laughs> Bill Gates mm-hmm. for saving the company. All the people that were in the crowd booed when they heard about that, 
And the funny thing is the only reason Microsoft did that was not so that they can make profit off, off of Apple. It was so that they could maintain the yep. appearance of having competition. Of having competition. Mm -hmm. That's all it was. And the government it fell worked. for it. <laughs> yeah, the government fell for it. <laughs> so, I mean, a lot of times it's really just about, you know, jumping through the flaming hoops and, and making people believe the right thing. Yeah, and like not even in terms of government, but just in terms of public opinion too. You have like, you get that with video game consoles too. I know it's not nearly on the same level, but if you maintain that rivalry between two companies, it makes it look even better and that you're not a monopoly because, you know, you know, I'm an Apple fan, I'm a Microsoft fan, but in reality, you know, it's the same company. Like, not really, but if they bailed out your company, they still owe them a debt in some way. <laughs> sure. Well, and you look at, you know, we stick with technology, you look at microprocessors. So you've got Intel and you've got AMD. And AMD has always been sort of the redheaded stepchild uh, to Intel, where they were the rebels, they were the underdogs. Uh, their processors were for like the elite group of gamers or overclockers or whatever. And you look at what happened to Intel and Intel has in recent years been completely burned by their technology choices because of the shortcuts that they made that AMD didn't make. And AMD picked up a huge market mm -hmm. share. And now you're seeing another fundamental shift that's detrimental to Intel with Apple moving away from Intel processors in their computers now to their own designed ones that they're manufacturing themselves. So Intel is getting hit again with this. Um, so that this was an instance where Intel got very complacent in what they were doing. And now they've fallen significantly behind in the processor market. Uh, and the tables have kind of shifted. But at the time when Intel was dominant, Intel was actually supplying information and support to AMD to maintain that mm. appearance of competition. Works every time. <laughs> um, so again, it really is. It's just a matter of appearance sometimes to keep from getting hit for, with monopolistic uh, charges. Mm. Um, so we talked briefly about AT&T. The most prominent monopoly breakup in the U.S. history was AT&T. After being allowed to control the nation's telephone service for decades as a government-supported monopoly, the giant telecommunications company found itself challenged by antitrust laws. In 1982, after uh, an eight-year court battle, AT&T had to divest itself of 22 local exchange service companies and has been forced to sell off assets or split units several times since. Now, the real interesting thing is you had what were termed as baby bells during this. So you had all these certified local exchange CLEX, cert certified local exchange carriers pop up all over the country that were all part of the original one. And over the last 10 to 15 years, you've seen all those get swept up and they're now owned by Verizon. So you went through that huge natural monopoly that the government allowed to breaking them up when they thought the competition was stifled to now mergers happening to get you back to that position where you have two people that are running. The yeah. So many it's history in general is cyclical. And I think we're seeing that here too. Right. So in maybe, I don't know, 15, 20 years, we'll have another breakup and they'll all come back out again. And then in 30 years, they'll all get swept up again. I yeah. think that's just how these things work. And honestly. that's just, and I think that's kind of the, the, the point here is that, that's capitalism. Mm -hmm. That's how capitalism works is that monopolies are a natural outcome of capitalism. And I think the best that government can hope in most cases is to try to keep it at bay as long as possible. And eventually they're still going to get gobbled up and, and get eaten up. Your, your pharmacies had the same thing. Your internet providers had the same thing. You know, I remember back in the nineties when I worked for an internet provider, you had, just in our area, probably 10 different internet carriers. Now you can't get internet from anybody other than Comcast here. Mm -hmm. uh, you cable, you had three different cable companies that you could get service from. Uh, so it's just a, a life cycle, I think, of business in, in a capitalist society. So we're going to take another break and come back and talk about more about our uh, modern monopoly problem in America. Thank you.
For over seven years, the Second Sith Empire has been the premier community guild in the online game Star Wars The Old Republic. With hundreds of friendly and helpful active members, a weekly schedule of nightly events, annual guild meet and greets, and an active community both on the web and on Discord. The Second Sith Empire is more than your typical gaming group. We're family. Join us on the Star Forge server for nightly events such as operations, flashpoints, world boss hunts, Star Wars trivia, guild lottery, and much more. Visit us on the web today at www.thesecondsithempire.com. Welcome back to Insights into Tomorrow. We're talking modern monopolies. So Forbes did an interesting article uh, about America's modern monopoly problem. They said, without realizing it, we've become a nation of monopolies. A large and growing part of our co economy is owned by a handful of companies that face little competition. They have no incentive to deliver better products or to get more efficient. They simply rake in cash from people who have no choice but to hand it over. This would be impossible if we had true capitalism. Even if we admit some businesses are natural monopolies, most aren't. Most of them found some non-capitalistic flaw to exploit. In theory, this problem should have solved itself as technology and consumer preferences change, yet it hasn't. Axios outlined a problem in, re in a recent article on farm bankruptcies. Why don't you tell us about what they found? Sure. Uh, so three companies control about 80% of mobile telecoms. Three have 95% of credit cards. Four have 70% of airline flights within the United States. Uh, Google handles 60% of all searches online. Uh, in agriculture, four companies control 66% of U.S. hogs slaughtered in 2015, 85% of the steer and half of the chickens according to the Department of Agriculture. Uh, and finally, just four companies control 85% of U.S. corn seed sales. Uh, that's up from 60% in 2000, so there was some consolidation there. Uh, and 75% of soybean seed, a jump from about half, uh, according to the Agriculture Department. That's pretty staggering, <clears throat> and that's not even talking big tech, where a lot of our focus is today. I mean, we're talking telecoms, credit cards, airlines, uh, search, which we'll get to, and agriculture. I mean, our agriculture is really tied up to that few companies. I mean, I find that alarming at best. What's your thoughts on that? Yeah, you go back to the your ocean spray example, where it's it's one company, but it's made up of smaller farms. Is that? I guess that's probably similar. That's to what's probably happening. would be in this. Yeah. Yeah. So it's it's you know, if you want to have a successful farm, you have to join up with this company. Basically, is what you're getting at, and that is a monopoly, but. If the farms are getting, the independent farms are getting their proper cut, it's not as bad as it could be, right? Where they're just being exploited for their product. Right. I mean, I don't know. It's it's like this big company just become a part of, I suppose, if you want to have a farm. I don't know. Yeah. Well, and one of the things that they talk about, they talk about a couple, couple different outcomes that we get from this. One is being... Uh, having a gummed up economy. Some economists say the concentration of market power is gumming up the economy and largely to blame for decades of flat wages and weak productivity growth. They say gumming up the economy is a good way to, to describe it because we're getting competition that competition itself is an economic lubricant and the machine machines work more efficiently when the parts are moving freely. We get more output from the same input or the same output with less input. Take away the competition and it all begins to grind together, kind of like a internal combustion engine that you don't keep the oil changed in. Eventually, friction brings it to a halt and sometimes a fiery one. Normally, companies grow their profits by delivering better products at lower prices than their competitors. It's a dynamic process with competitors constantly dropping out and new ones appearing. This has been described as what's called creative, quote, creative destruction, which sounds harsh, but it's absolutely necessary for economic growth. 
Today, the creative destruction isn't happening. And as companies refuse to die and monopolies refuse to improve, we struggle to generate even mild economic growth. And I think we're seeing that across our entire economy at this point in time. What are are your thoughts on that? Yeah, definitely. I mean, we just read off all those examples of all those companies that own everything, right? So I think if, especially when you get to the point where you're too big of a company to fail and it refuses to die, just like that article said, when, when you're at that level where you control over half of, you know, some kind of domestic uh, product, it's going to be difficult for you to fail, even if you wanted to. And then you end up getting the stagnation that we're seeing today. Absolutely. Yeah. They also talk about uncreative destruction. Creative destruction means companies go out of business and workers lose their jobs. Maybe a few competitors will hire them eventually, but they suffer in the meantime. Politicians try to try to help, but finding the right balance is hard. Greater blame should be assigned to the central bankers, <coughs> not just the Fed, but its peers as well. For whatever reason, they kept short-term stimulus measures and near zero rates for far too long. The resulting flood of capital bypassed the creative destruction process. A lot of this happened under the radar. You've probably seen stories about the Lyft IPO and other unicorns that will soon go public. Unicorns being a type of uh, a wishful company going public mm. with a very high IPO. The news, this new, this is news because it's now so unusual. The number of listed companies is, is shrinking because A, cheap capital lets them stay private longer, and B, the founders and venture capitalists often exit by selling to a larger cash flush competitor instead of going public. An economy in which it's easier and cheaper to buy your competitors rather than out-innovate them is probably headed towards stagnation. And that's the problem that we had. We saw all through the 1800s, competition was being bought up constantly. The railroads, the consolidation in the auto industry in the the early half of the 20th century. Anytime that you see competition just being eaten up by buying them out, you're not innovating at all when you buy. You just have companies that are so large they can buy out anybody that's that's competing with them. Facebook is doing the same exact thing now. Facebook has bought up four or five major uh, competitors, all in different sectors of what they do, but they're buying their way to success. And that stifles innovation. What are your, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, definitely. I mean, we talked earlier about that barrier to entry, right? That's one of the biggest things when you're looking at these monopolies. And if, you're a small startup trying to compete with somebody like Facebook and they just offer you a blank check to just buy you out. It's hard to say no to that, especially if you know that there's, you have no real hope of competing with them. And I think that the more they just, because when Facebook buys you out, they then also get more powerful because they have your, your, your workforce or your resources or whatever you had to offer and they have less competition. So they only get more powerful. Uh, it's, it's a, it's a win-win in the worst kind of way, I think, especially when it, for consumers and the economy. Yeah. And, and part of the problem that you have is because of this, <coughs> you have companies that shouldn't be in business are getting bought out and, and they're, the technology they have is inferior technology, but you have larger companies buying them, not because of the technology so they can integrate it into their own, they're buying their users. So you may have a company uh, I don't want to say Quibi, but you know, a company like Quibi that spent all this money up front on advertising and, and, you know, we'll say technology, although it's not that, that revolutionary, but their whole goal was to basically get a whole bunch of people on the platform and then sell it. And in their case, they failed in their case, they projected something like 70 million people signing on with this 1.5 billion budget or something that they had, they wound up getting 70,000 people actually subscribing to it and they went out of business. That's the exception to the rule. Whereas that should be the natural order of how Mm -hmm. business works. Especially with capitalism. If you're not a good business, you should just fail. (laughs) Absolutely. Um, But, you know, instead you have companies that they garner this large following and it could be because of certain people that might be on your service. 
Um, one of the things that Twitter ran into was that when they banned Donald Trump around the time of the January 6th insurrection, their user base dropped off significantly because all of his supporters mm -hmm. stopped using the service. That cult following is enough to start your own social network, bring all those people on board, and then sell those users. Even if the, the social network itself is outdated, the technology is 90 years old, they're selling eyes at that point in time. And that's generally not how business is done because in most cases, traditionally, the consumer isn't the product. Yeah, The product is something you produce. Mm -hmm. But in the case of technology and social media today, the consumer is the product because that's where people are making money with all your information. So it kind of breaks the rules and that's why we kind of have an upset balance here. So we're going to take our last break here and we're going to come back and look at the future of regulating monopolies and why tech might be different. Insights into Entertainment, a podcast series taking a deeper look into entertainment and media. Our husband and wife team of pop culture fanatics are exploring all things from music and movies to television and fandom. We'll look at the interesting and obscure entertainment news of the week. We'll talk about theme park and pop culture news. We'll give you the latest and greatest on pop culture conventions. We'll give you a deep dive into Disney, Star Wars, and much more. Check out our video episodes at youtube.com backslash insights into things. Our audio episodes at podcast.insightsintoentertainment.com or check us out on the web at insightsintothings.com. Welcome back to Insights Into Tomorrow. We're talking monopolies, and we're going to talk about how to regulate today's monopolies in tomorrow's market. So when the global financial crisis slowly subsided in the spring of 2010, tech giants Google, Apple, Facebook, and Amazon, known collectively as GAFA. I've never heard that before. I haven't either. <clears throat> I didn't write the article, though. So. <laughs> uh, they were collectively valued at just under 450 billion euros by market cap. These companies were drivers of innovation that pointed the way forward. Enterprises at the center of a flourishing technological ecosystem with a creative and technology-driven vision. Over the past decade, the transformation of society's relationship to those companies is unprecedented. We use the products of these companies to manage almost our entire professional and private lives. And during the coronavirus crisis, the value of the tech giants have increased even more. So when we put together the idea of the show, these were really the companies that we we're talking about for today's modern monopolies. Um, how do you feel about the, you, first of all, let me ask, do you use their products? I think that's probably the most important question to ask anybody. Yeah. I mean, it's kind of hard not to, right? At least like Google and Amazon, even, even if you don't buy things from Amazon, Amazon still controls a lot of web traffic too for their searches. So you're using them either way. Um, but yeah, I don't use, I don't have any, I don't think I have any Apple products anymore. I did though, for a while I was an iPhone user. Um, I have a Facebook and Instagram account. I don't really use, but I still look at them. So they're getting, you know, my eyes either way. Uh, and then Google, I use all their products and services. So yeah, I'm, I'm pretty far in. Yeah. And I think one of the biggest things to keep in mind here is that these companies don't just influence the American economy. The, these are global companies that have a major impact on the world. So looking at, a con at the monopolies of tomorrow, I think we have to ask ourselves probably a few questions and, and, and kind of come to terms with a few things. Like one is how we handle the U.S. monopolies today will dictate Europe's future and, and even to a certain extent the rest of the world, don't you think? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that in our modern age, it's all, it's a global economy. It's not as isolationist as it used to be with things like standard oil and things like that. Yeah. And I think the other thing is, is that even though, you know, it's, it's hard to envision, but the technological revolution isn't over. We're, we're kind of 
still in the early phases of it. And, and I think one of the issues that we run into is that we don't make the rules as fast as the technology grows. Would you agree with that? Yeah. I mean, just in the last, I don't know, five, six years, you had Snapchat show up, which blew up again and became a, another staple in the social media icon, you know, on your phone um, that a lot of people use and is now a publicly traded company. So I think that we're definitely going to see it again. TikTok as well is also huge. Yeah. So I think that, you know, every couple of years, it's, you know, just how these things work. You'll get a whole new social media app or, or something along those lines. Yeah, and I, I think one of the issues that concerns me is that the room for maneuvering needed to figure all this stuff out is shrinking. The time that we have to put measures in place now to govern these things is running out rapidly. Um, if we want to know what to do next, it's vital that we gain some in-depth understanding of the mechanisms by which the tech monopolies operate. And I think part of the problem that we have is that the people in, in our country, at least, that are making these laws don't have a clue about technology. Yeah. I mean, they, they really have no idea how it works, how it progresses, the impact that it has, the security. You know, there's a lot of talk right now about cybersecurity because of the pipeline hack and all these, you know, the, the uh, Microsoft Exchange hack and the solar winds, all this stuff, this cybersecurity is in the news. And our politicians are, are trying their best, really, to pay lip service to it, but have no idea whatsoever what the technology means. Like, for instance, my, my biggest question, you know, sticking with the pipeline uh, incident, they got hit with ransomware. Well, why in the world was your pipeline network even connected to the Internet? Absolutely no reason for that. And yet there isn't a single politician who's asked that question yet because they don't understand. They just think the Internet is some nebulous piece of technology that connects everything. And these are the people that are making the laws. What, what do you think about that? I th yeah, I think that's definitely part of the problem. I think you saw it too back when like, any new technology, when it showed up, like TV, like blew people's minds and they thought it was going to like, you know, give you the devil in you. So I think it's something like this too. And eventually we'll hopefully catch, or they'll hopefully catch up. But I think the difference with modern technology is that it's progressing way faster than things like TV ever did. I mean, it's changing almost on a yearly basis what the norms are. So I think that, the pace is much more accelerated. <clears throat> yeah. So let's, 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 you know, take a second to take a look at what the current tech mono tech monopolies are and, and why they're different. So I think the biggest thing, and we've touched on this already is that tech monopolies survive on data and algorithms. That's their product. You as the consumer are their product. Um, they take your information and they sell it for advertising. They're not necessarily selling you anything. Amazon doesn't make any money off anything that it sells from its store. It's literally a break even. It's a loss leader for them. They make their money on their Amazon web services, which everybody hosts everything through their Amazon web services, which ironically was kind of an offshoot for their own needs. They had to build out their own network to support the Amazon store. And they found out that they could rent space on their cloud huh. and make more money. But Google, you're the product. They collect your data. Facebook, you're the product. Um, Amazon, you're the product. With Apple, Apple recognized this. And now in the latest version of Apple's uh, operating system, they implemented this new privacy feature where applications have to ask if you want them to track your movement outside the application. Which, if you think about it, is almost a no-brainer. Like, no, why do I want Facebook tracking me in other apps? But Facebook is actually fighting this to the point that they're threatening legal action because they're saying that it gives Apple an unfair advantage. Mm. So Apple has access to that information, but Facebook doesn't. So therefore, Apple has an advantage. I mean, I guess, but it's like, geez, guys. <laughs> it's like just the two crazy billionaires yelling at each other for yeah. more money. You know, if you look at the, the companies in the 20th centuries, their wealth came from factories and machines and employee qualified employees and the stuff that they made that consumers purchased. So it was much easier to say, okay, well, you're not innovating cars fast enough. You're not innovating um, 
refrigerators or whatever it happened to be because you had an actual defined product. How do you tell when you're not innovating services enough if the consumer's the product? Like, like what's the answer to that question? I mean, then we get into a question of, of privacy, right? Because the only way to innovate that is to become more intrusive in people's lives and to collect more data on them. And then that's a whole nother can of worms of, of where you draw that line of if it's just you're purely just a product at that point and the, the human element is completely removed. Absolutely. <clears throat> so over the past decade, the big tech companies have built a huge competitive advantage because they control the operating systems and the search engines and the browsers and all the cloud infrastructure. They also own the shopping marketplaces, the communications platforms, the networked household appliances, and the app stores. To return to our picture of the 20th century, tech monopolies not only have factories and machines, they also increasingly own the entire infrastructure of the value creation chain, including all the businesses and all the communication channels to the customer. Which, being that ingrained and essentially owning control of the economy, makes it almost impossible to regulate them. Don't you agree? Yeah, I mean, it's almost like it's too late. Um, it reminds me of, and this is sort of related, but movies. Uh, there used to be, there was a big Paramount decision in like the 30s because they owned distribution, production, and uh, exhibition, which was like movie theaters. Right. And that's what it, this reminds me of. They're owning every single step of the chain, which is a monopoly. But in this instance, they're way too powerful to be stopped at this point. Right. And, you know, the capital that the big tech companies suck out of the system using this mechanism is fed straight back in undermining the competition or accessing new areas of business. Vendors on Amazon's marketplace are just as dependent on the goodwill of the platform as media companies are on Google and Facebook. This goodwill can only be acquired by consistently providing access to all content and data, thus continuing to feed the monopoly and making it more efficient. So even for competition to work, they have to cooperate with the big tech and provide the big tech exactly what they need to give the big tech the, the yeah. authority in the first competition place. Competition in quotes there a little bit. Exactly, exactly. So the enormous profitability of the infrastructure services allows the big tech companies to invest in new fields of business on a very long-term basis. To do this, the monopolists are willing to accept high losses for many years in order to weaken the competition and build up market shares. Um, it's ironic what Amazon is doing because Amazon is doing online in the marketplace exactly what Walmart did. So Walmart had this reputation for buying everything in bulk and selling it very cheap with very little overhead. And they would come into a town and they would open up a mega store. And they put all the other small mom and pop businesses out of, out of business because they couldn't compete. Uh -huh. They didn't have this, the economy of scale to compete with Walmart. Amazon now shows up and they started out selling books at first and they changed the way we bought books. Well, it wasn't long before they started selling everything. Uh -huh. And now not only do they sell everything, you can get it delivered in two days for free if you're an Amazon Prime member. You can get it delivered the next day if you're in certain geographic locations. They basically are putting companies like Am like Walmart out of business mm -hmm. yeah, because yeah, they definitely. can sell it cheaper than Walmart. Yep. And that's not even counting all the other services they provide too. Their you know their video streaming services as a competitor to Netflix. I mean they're they're omnipresent. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean they're they're literally everywhere. They're in the music. Yeah. They're in, they're producing their own TV shows, they're producing their own movies that they're putting up for awards. They're selling goods. There's a situation, there's several situations Amazon's been involved in where they've had uh people on their service cuz you can sell through Amazon. So they've had people on their service that were selling I think one was diapers.com. Mm -hmm. Um they were selling uh, low overhead diapers through Amazon. Well, Amazon decided that they were now going to sell diapers and they would buy their diapers in much larger bulk than diapers.com could. And they would sell them at below cost. They could take the loss 
because they had plenty of other profit leaders elsewhere that they could absorb it through. And eventually they got to the point where they put this company out of business. And that's a practice that they've done over and over again. And it isn't like diapers.com was bringing in so much money selling diapers that it was a threat to Amazon. So there was no reason to put them out of business. Amazon simply wanted to own that business, and now they do. Yeah, I guess I guess for them, even if there was a chance, a 1% chance that diapers.com could have taken over the diaper industry, they had to take that as an absolute certainty. Yeah. And, and they did. And that's really what the scary thing is with these monopolies today, is that they have that ability. You know, they could literally give their products away for six months and put everyone else out of business so that they're the only one left after six months. They could absorb that loss. And now... That bottle of water that cost you a dollar before and I'll cost you $10 because you don't have a choice, mm -hmm. which is kind of scary. So let's talk a little bit about where we think the future of monopolies is going and we can sort of sum up this discussion. So I jot, jotted down a few talking points here. I want to bounce them off of you. Um, my first point is that technology moves faster than legislation. Is that something that you would agree with? Yeah, we already talked about that in terms of I compared it to television, but yeah, absolutely. Especially today, it's moving even faster than you know people in charge of making laws and, and politicians can even fathom. Yeah, and and today's monopolies are more complicated than railroads and telephones ever were. Uh, there's more of an international impact from today's monopolies than ever before. How? What kind of impact do you think that will have on regulating these? companies that are too big to fail moving forward. I think we're going to have to change the notion of a product, right? Because they're not, it's not a tangible thing that you can get. It's, it's data, it's information that's being sold. So I think that's going to be the first step in, in really making some serious change on how to, to stop these monopolies is changing what we view as, you know, the product. Do you think from a domestic standpoint that the U S government should be regulating these? Or do you think we should be turning that sort of authority over to, the World Trade Organization or or something on a bigger scale? Uh, I think the government, the U.S. government should step in and then do it because these are United States-based companies. And I think that there is a degree of responsibility there. Now, in reality, that's probably not going to happen because they have really no reason to, uh, especially because, like we've said a bunch of times, that these companies are already way too powerful to be regulated. Um, but maybe if, uh, you know... But, the World Trade Organization and the U.S. government, you know, teamed up. I don't really know how that works in terms of, of law, um, but perhaps, you know, that level of force would, would get something done. I could certainly see that. I, I could see, you know, even if you go regionally with things like the European Union and, and stuff like that where you might be able to regulate that. Let's talk penalties for a minute. So we already kind of talked about the fact that the penalties that are being imposed on these companies are, are really insignificant. How do you punish a company for monopolistic practices when they have economies larger than most countries in the world? It's really hard to. Uh, I mean, I'm, I was thinking of something like when they broke up AT&T, but how are we going to break up Amazon, right? I mean, I guess you could do it where like they own Whole Foods, so Whole Foods would then become its own company again. Maybe something like that would work. Or all the different independent sellers that they've tried to acquire, like our diapers.com example – breaking those up and making them their own independent companies. But then logistically they're not going to succeed because they're not on the Amazon app, <laughs> which is what everybody's using. So it's, it's a very difficult thing that, uh, you know, I'm not an economist, so I have no idea how you'd even begin. I mean, more money would be ideal, but like you said, they're bigger than some small countries. So how much money can you realistically find them? Right. And, and the last thing that I want to throw out there is one that, yeah, it seems to seep into every conversation that we have, and that's politics. You know, you have governments that benefit too much from monopolies. You know, the number of people that Amazon employs, uh, the impact it has on the economy and the unemployment rate, and the amount of tax dollars that they get from these companies is vast. Um, you have politicians whose constituents are benefiting by having, you know, Amazon recently had a, a big competition about where they're going to put their new headquarters. And you had companies or you had cities rather that were vying for it, offering up, you know, tax incentives and everything, almost like it was the Olympics. And you had people vying for the Olympics. They were 
they were politicians falling all over each other to try to get Amazon in their, in their districts. When you have that kind of power that you have politicians that are catering to you and, and mind you, we talk about corrupt politicians and the fact that the United States has the best politicians money can buy all the time here. But when you have politicians that are falling all over themselves without you even gracing their palm with any money, just the fact that you're bringing that kind of business and economic benefit to their districts, how are you going to have these same politicians now regulate these companies and break them up and try to push some control over them? How do you get past the politics of it? I mean, you don't really. I mean, this reminds me of, I, we studied a lot of the, around the Sherman antitrust time, those politics of that time in high school. And there was a lot of cartoons of like a big octopus that was standard oil that would like have its tentacles in politics. And this is kind of what that reminds me of. Um, except that I think today, while everybody knows about Amazon's, like how poorly they treat their workers and things like that. And the, you know, the accidents that have happened on the company lines, I still think Amazon is still viewed publicly very positively because of their convenience, right? So I think that that's going to be a major step too because the politicians associated with Amazon aren't like as nefarious as they were when they were associated with Standard Oil. So it's a matter of public perception of even having the pressure on the politicians in the first place to make the change. I think you're right. I mean, I'm a Amazon user. Yeah. I'm a Google user. I'm a Apple user. Uh, I don't use Facebook. Um the show's on Facebook, but I don't manage that. I don't log into Facebook. And the problem that I have is I know these companies are problems, but I still use them mm -hmm. and I will continue to use them. Um, they're not evil enough for me to not e – Facebook is evil enough. Face Facebook to me is, is accessible, so I won't use Facebook. But these other companies provide benefit to me. And I don't personally feel the detriment that's associated with them. So it's very hard for me to even advocate breaking them up or cracking down on them or whatever. Uh, so unfortunately, I don't have any answers myself. Yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting moral question. Right? And I think we get that with a lot of industries. If you really look into them, they're all evil in their own ways. Right. But it's a matter of, of your daily life. And when what's one person going to do? That if one person were to stop using this product, realistically, how many products would they have to stop using? Yeah. You have to stop using the internet and probably if you wanted to stop benefiting Amazon. That's you, true. you can not buy Amazon products, but you're still going to benefit them in some way. That's It goes back to their, their omnipresence. Yeah, you're absolutely right. I think this is probably one of the first episodes that we've done where our future look didn't really have a path forward. I don't think any of us, either of us, have an answer on how to solve this moving forward. It's Wally. -E. They're going to become by and large. We're going to have to fly off the planet because all the Amazon boxes are stacked up in the cities. There you go. There you go. So I think that that's kind of all we can add to this discussion today. I think that was all we had today. Did you have anything else you wanted to add? Nope. Uh, well, thank you for listening, folks. Uh, before we go, I would uh, invite folks to subscribe to the podcast. You can get video versions of the podcast if you look for insights into things. That will give you video episodes of all of our shows. If you just want audio episodes of this show, you can look up Insights Into Tomorrow. We're available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Stitcher, uh, iHeartRadio, Amazon. <laughs> Google. <laughs> <laughs> yes, all those evil people. Yeah. Uh, I would also uh, encourage folks to uh, contact us. You can uh, give us some suggestions on what topics you'd like us to discuss, any feedback on the performance that we've done. You can email us at comments at insightsintothings.com. We're on Twitter at insights underscore things. We uh, stream five days a week, this week, six days a week on Twitch at Twitch dot tv slash insights into things if you are an amazon prime subscriber uh you do get a free twitch prime monthly subscription we'd appreciate it if you threw that our way on facebook we are facebook.com should have plugged the shows in the beginning <laughs> <laughs> yes we are part of the problem i i understand that <laughs> Uh, we have no other, that's a, that's another byproduct of the monopolies we have no other way to get our our products out there without mm -hmm. using them but on Facebook, you can get us at facebook.com slash insights into things podcast. And on Instagram, we are at insights into things, or you can go to our website at www.insightsintothings.com for links to all of those things. 
Anything else before we go? Any closing thoughts? No, that's, I think that's it. All right. The world is owned by the monopolies. <laughs> it's a good game, too. You should try playing it. That's all for this week, this month, or whenever we do another one. Uh, any closing words? <laughs> no. We'll see you next time, <laughs> folks. <laughs> that's it. Another one in the books. Goodbye. <laughs>